Hello! Welcome to Buzzing with Cousin, Cousin Talk, connecting with locals. Sorry about the delay there. Little technical uh, technical difficulty. Uh, I'd like to shout out before we start this great show uh, about uh, different organizations and people that have pulled us through this pandemic. Uh, museums that have been uh, giving classes, art associations, drawing classes, virtual shows, chefs doing cooking demonstration, interviewers, musicians doing shows. It's been great. You've been keeping our lives a little better. Hopefully we'll be back together soon. Okay, let's get this show on the road here. Our first guest is a lady and she's a member of the Fisherman's Wharf Association. She's the president. She's the chairman of the world-class event, Whale Fest Monterey. Please welcome Mary Alice Cerrito Fetish. Hi, Johnny. Yes, welcome to the show. Thank Welcome you for having me on board, your your show. This is great. This is very exciting. I love it. Yeah. So, uh, Mary Alice, if I uh, I got went through your profile, if I list everything that you've done in this community, we need another seven hours. <laughs> All I want to say is, I uh, we appreciate your dedication to Monterey and many years of dedication to Fisherman's Wharf. We thank you. Well, thank you, Johnny. Yeah. So it's uh, been pretty exciting to be uh, part of this uh, extended family. My grandfather established a two-table restaurant uh, close to the war in 1926. And so my family's been around for a, a little while. And um, it's very exciting dealing with all of the different uh, intricacies, especially right now for Fisherman's Wharf, making sure that um, the restaurants and the, and the shops are able to stay open and be able to survive the current situation between COVID and smoke. It's kind of a, a, a pretty uh, exciting time. Uh, we've come up with all sorts of policies to be able to make sure that people are able to still enjoy the wharf and maintain their six foot distancing, enjoying the fine foods on the restaurant and all the fun things that are in the, in the gift stores. Plus being able to go whale watching and fishing and sailing it. So it's, it's still a, a it's still a great time to be had on the wharf. And so, uh, I commend the restaurants for their outdoor seating. Uh, it's really beautiful. And uh, I'm not kidding. If I uh, if I didn't know, I thought that those uh, patios were, have been there for years. Oh, just, for sure. It's uh, just the absolute uh, charming uh, European-looking kind of wharf now. I love it. Maybe, maybe, yeah. they could, maybe they could leave a couple of them after. Wait, well, we're, we're hoping that that's uh, – going to happen when COVID is all gone, those outside seating will still be there. We're still looking forward to all of that uh, charm and uh, new ambiance that the uh, the wharf has. That's so um, if I may, I'd love to talk a little bit about uh, what we're doing about uh, Whale Fest. So for those of you who don't know, Whale Fest just celebrated its 10th anniversary. Uh, it's a free, fun, educational event. Um, that we hold at the end of January uh, to celebrate the migration of the great whales. Now, for those of you who don't know, there's whales out there all year long. And if you don't see a whale on the day that you go whale watching, most of the whale watching companies will give you a, um, what do you call it? Not an IOU, anyway, a piece of paper that says, hey, come back and we'll make sure you see whales because they really are out there. And uh, so, um, and we've got uh, dozens of kinds of whales and sea, sea harbor seals and or sea lions and and otters. You know these things you can see from the shore. But I, you know, 
our, our, our bay is so unique. You know, this, this um, canyon that we're on, we're able to access all these fabulous sites immediately within five, 10 minutes of being on a boat. You get to see all the, the incredible wonders. Actually, you know what? There was a great white shark right in front of scales last last week a few days ago oh, that's unbelievable. Unbelievable. yeah i mean it you know we're able to access everything so easily and um, so anyway i wanted to tell you a little bit more about uh, the uh fest the, we have a symposium where we invite our world experts uh marine experts uh to talk a bit about what their latest um uh, research is or just the, what their favorite subject is and we give them free reign as far as what they'd like to talk about yeah. um so there's about 18 research marine research institutes that surround the monterey bay so we have an incredible number of people that we can uh draw on and an incredible number of subjects so sort of as a as an example the this last year we had um, a fellow talking about the Davidson Seamount. He was uh, from NOAA, and he was talking to us about the uh, wonderful octopus, new octopus garden that they that they found there. And um, uh, his name is Chad King. Uh, and then we also had um, Julie Packard, who talked about you know, just the wonderful nature of the, of the aquarium and what it took to put it together and what it takes to keep it together. And of course, right now, it's a really tough time for, for everybody involved. Um, mm -hmm. And um, and we had another lady who uh, spoke about um, creating art, metal art. So she fuses all the stuff she gets from junkyards and she sinks beautiful art into the ocean and then she electrocutes it and because of this electrolysis it brings coral so she's creating coral gardens through art and engineering so she, she was she was uh, very she was very exciting uh, we also had Jay Nichols uh, a, a, um, a New York Times a best-selling author who uh, wrote The Blue Mind, which explains why you need water. You need it to, you need to hear it, you need to see it, obviously to drink it, to bathe in it, everything. And, and the, your cells change as a result of your exposure to water. It's, it's a fascinating book. and. Um, Oh, and just an anecdote, sadly, um, Jay Nichols' uh, home just burned in wow. that Santa Cruz fire. Um, Peggy Stapp always brings us, she's the director of Marine Life Studies. She always brings us up to date on the latest whale uh, entrapment. And uh, they also have an exhibit at the uh, Whale Fest with the tools that they use to, uh, to to disentangle the whales, and they're uh, anyway very. It's, that's a very exciting um, exhibit. Uh, one of our most popular exhibits, and obviously we're going to be reinventing Whale Fest for January of next year. But in the past, we've had D, which is a forty-three foot long inflated uh, humpback whale. She's a female whale. I don't know if things are different if it was a male whale. But anyway, when you walk inside of the whale, you get to see where the organs are. And, and I never expected the organs to be where they are. It's, it's quite exciting. Um, and uh, the, uh, the uh, Bill Gilly is the world expert on Humboldt squid. Now, I know because you're from Monterey, you're familiar with the Humboldt squid that they, they can grow over 20, 30 feet long. They're monstrous. Exactly. They're monstrous. They don't taste good, but they're monstrous. Well, at least I haven't figured out how to make it taste good. But um, they, they now are maturing at about two feet in the Sea of Cortez. So 
this is extraordinary. So any, any, if anybody's catching a, a very large uh, Humboldt squid right now, that's a really old squid because the new puppies that are coming up the way, they're only two feet long at maturity and they're making babies that are only growing to be two feet long. So Bill Billy is very upset. He doesn't know why this is happening. But to educate the public, he brings about a, I don't know, five or six foot humpback, uh, humpback, a Humboldt squid to the whale fest and dissects it for people, showing them just how the body works. But he shows how the lens of the eye of the Humboldt squid is the same as the human eye. And so this is, you know, a very exciting and extraordinary thing. Oh, I wanted to mention one thing. And during the, during the whale fest, all of the whale watching boats and the fishing boats and the sailboats are available for people to go out. Now, the event is free, but obviously those are not the three things. But we also bring a whole lot of boats to the event. So we bring research vessels from NOAA, Landing Marine Labs, and from Marine Life Studies. The Coast Guard brings their boats, which are rescue boats. They've got this one extraordinary boat. It's called a surf boat. And uh, it's a 29-footer. And when it when it gets rolled over in violent big seas, it flips itself right back over. And I don't know what happens to the guys inside, but the boat's upright. And uh, the fire boat comes shooting off uh, the, the big spray of water. Very exciting. And then also the yacht club brings sailboats and teaches. They, they bring them up to the... Um, to the causeway near the Custom House Plaza. And so you're able to see how to how to tie knots properly. Uh, they give lectures on how to properly sail in the Monterey Bay National Marine Sanctuary so you're not harming the critters and creatures. You gotta you know stay a particular distance from them. Uh, yeah and um also one of our one of, we have several activities one of our unusual activities is that Monterey Bay Abalone Company brings their abalones and they um, the, the little ones but this big and and uh, we we have a big uh, kitty swimming pool for them and then they we have races abalone races and if you cover if you create a shade with for the abalone then they think they're really safe and they're protected from predators. Oh, yeah. Then they, they take off and <clears throat> and they start running to the shade of the side of the swimming pool. And people sponsor the different um, abalones and we have lots of fun watching them race. Oh, um, right. Okay, great. Yeah. Racing, they're racing. They're, they really do move all 21 legs or however many they have. It's more like racing. Oh, number three. <laughs> is it, is it, uh, yeah. what, a, a two-day event? Or? Yeah, two-day event, 10 to 5. And uh, uh, as we said, I'm not exactly sure how we're going to do it. Probably half virtual and half live or real um, when it comes to January. We're still, our committee is is working uh, like crazy trying to figure figure things out. Uh, we've had a, a couple of events just to keep the whale fest top of mind. Um, my husband, Nick Fettis, is a, an accomplished pianist, and he raised yeah. a lot of funds with a concert. And then um, uh, we had an essay uh, contest uh, asking uh, kids in middle school and high school to uh, review our symposium because all, the, all of our symposiums are on YouTube. So everybody can go back to... 2020, 20, 2019, 18, 17, I think even a part of 16 is is to catch these fabulous um, as, uh, presentations. So we asked the kids to, to review what was presented in 2020 and then to listen. Mm -hmm. And so we had a great response. And the kids, uh, anyway, we had an award for them. And then Teeny Shake did a cooking demonstration for us. And the most, for me, the most exciting part was he showed us a great shortcut, how you can put together a chapino and a, a dinner in a half an hour. And that's, that's, my, that's my kind of cooking, let me tell you. That's great, yeah. So, so, 
um, the uh, uh, Whale Fest Monterey is a world event. I mean, you got people coming from out of the country. Absolutely. Uh, that's that's, that's true. very true. And yeah. different states. Uh, yeah, I think, I think we had something like 21 states and 10 countries because we do a survey. And so yeah. that's how we kind of figure out where we're, we're you know, where everybody has come from. And oh, another thing that uh, we found uh, unusual is that the ages were off the chart. I mean, to the very young, to the very, very old, as well as um, the education level, it crossed the board. Um, people who had multiple PhDs found the whale fest fascinating and that, that they can learn here. So it's not just kids who can learn like crazy and and adults and high school kids and you know, graduate students or whatever i mean people who've been in the marine world for a long time are still able to learn what we offer something for everybody and every year i learn more of what we are able to to offer it's, it's a, sort of a everything for everybody which is <laughs> pretty exciting so yeah to learn. Uh, do you extend to the plaza or, to, or the uh, so, plaza or everything's more? As an experiment, we did this last year and we found it, it expanded just a little bit too much. So, so uh, as I said, this for 2021, we're still kind of figuring it out. But let's say COVID's all gone in 2022, we yeah. would expand just a little bit into the uh, Custom House Plaza. Probably say like the, the one of the, of the Coast Guard boats, a couple of the very large exhibitors. Also, um, as we become more popular, we are being contacted by various organizations to, to come and join uh, the Whale Fest. So um, it's, it, it's growing. What's unique is that not every year will the same organizations be able to come because so many of these organizations are volunteer driven. And so it just depends how many volunteers they can get for two days, the weekend. So if these people are working Monday to Friday, do they necessarily want to give up both Saturday and Sunday in order to be able to, to operate? Um, just as, as an additional um we have we have music and um, and we have Gyutaku and scrimshaw. Uh, the Gyutaku is from our Japanese heritage. When prior to World War II, most of the businesses on the wharf were owned by Japanese, and so it's the ancient art of stenciling in general stenciling. But what they did was they stenciled fish in order to post it above their fish tanks and say, okay, here's the fish that's in here and this is how many we caught today. So what we do is um, Monterey Fish gives us some squid and some sardines and then we give kids paper or anybody, adult paper and then they, and, and multiple colors and then they're able to stencil the fish. So they paint the fish and then they, they put the paper on top and then we hang it up to dry and then they come back and get it. Now this, one of the things that we're working on right now as a committee is creating masks. And so what we're going to do is we're getting these really well-constructed, you know, COVID masks. Yeah. And we're going to stencil the squid and the fish onto the masks. Then you can wear a sardine or you can wear a squid anyway. And we're going to sell them. <laughs> anyway, they, that, that should be kind no. of fun. One of the things that I didn't get a chance to talk about is the Marine Mammal Center release. And we do that on Sunday morning, and that's something we probably will be able to do. I need to coordinate with the Marine Mammal Center. So a year and a half ago, last the, the 2019, they had two sea lions that they uh, rehabilitated. This year, they had one. And... Um, and so what they do is they take it down to Monterey Beach and they let it let it go back into the water. And it's a big deal. The, the, the year and a half ago, they had, when they had two, 
It was so sweet. It was like they kissed. They ran down the beach, they got to the water line, they kissed, and then they went in and the water. Went in. Wow. <laughs> that is really good. That is really great. And it sounds like uh, anybody out there watching, tuning in, is the Whale Fest Monterey is something for the whole family. Oh, uh, absolutely. Young kids, parents, uh, PhDs, uh, students. There's a little bit uh, whale fest for everything, and you're going down world famous Fisherman's Wharf. It's a it's a great event. And Mary Alice, how do we donate? And do you have any more fundraisers coming up? Okay, so yes, we uh, first of all, uh, whalefest dot org has a donate button. Just really simple, whalefest dot org, and as far as um, events coming up, I was telling you about you know the masks. So we're gonna we're gonna video that and show everybody how we made the mask, and uh, and then uh, we'll ask people to donate um, for the masks. But the one that I'm very curious how we're going to work this out is oh so I said earlier my husband pianist, and working with John Ryan at Mabari, he has hydrophones in Monterey Bay, and then we're going to work with a violinist. Now, when when John Ryan presented at the Whale Fest a couple of years ago, we had to bring in special woofers in order to have your body properly rattled. You know, like when you go to the movie theater and you watch uh, you know, a, a super movie or whatever, and your sh seat shakes? Okay like yeah. that you have so that is all that is the, the sounds that the blue whale makes that it the frequency level is so low that it moves your body so we're going to be comparing the frequency of the piano and the frequency of the violin so how low can you go on a piano and then how much lower does the gray whale go on a, on a frequency scale when then you're when you're dealing with the dolphins and you're at your the violin goes way up there right and in the dolphins are off the chart off off of our hearing chart and so to show the frequencies so we are we're in the process of, of putting that together so that the whole thing makes um is presented in a in in, in a, a fashion that we can see the charts hear the music and and um and and anyway so that we can ha have that all explained um so i'm really looking forward to that one i said the masks tim oh, thomas tim oh. thomas is going to give a oh, yeah. history of the wharf and we're going to work with tim tim has uh, been a presenter with the whale fest a couple of times. Uh, <clears throat> one time, Johnny, you, you think that the people who have been on the wharf forever know so much about the wharf. And there were several of us business owners who participated in his wharf walk, which is every first of the month, every Saturday, first Saturday of the month at 10 o'clock. Um, and when he got through with giving us a history all of us combined, we must have represented 200 years uh, on the wharf. Uh, uh, you know, if you combined us all together, yeah, we only knew about 25 percent of what yeah, he he's really unbelievable. Well, he's, wow. he, he's a walking museum, he's you know, he should be a national history, yeah. historic site. Yeah. <laughs> and so, he's really great. I had him on the show a couple of weeks ago, he was great. Uh, Mary Ellis, um. We really thank you for coming on to the show and sharing your a uh, little bit of your life on the wharf and Whale Fest Monterey. We're really going to be looking forward to it. If you have any information, make sure you post it. Let me know so I can let everybody know. And uh, I will. Thank you for what you do in the community and have a great day. Stay safe. Thanks so much for having me on, Johnny. Take care. Thank All you. Right. Bye-bye. Okay, that was great. Mary Alice Cerrito Fettis, longtime Monterey re resident. And
And uh, now, before we go to our second guest, I got a little reminder. And uh, the reminder is the wharf, speaking of the wharf, the wharf parking lot, Monday through Thursday, two hours of free parking, Monday through Thursday. All you got to do is show an ID, a local ID, and you got two hours. Park your car, go to the brewery. Get a designated driver, but go to the brewery, go to the wharf, have lunch, have an early dinner, take a walk. So take advantage of it. Monday through Thursday, two hours of free parking. Okay, great. Okay, let me introduce our second guest. Our second guest is the co-owner of Parsonage Winery. Please welcome Bill Parsons. Hi, Bill. How are you? Fine, how you doing? Johnny. How are you? I'm great. doing great. Welcome to the show. Thanks for the invite. Yeah, you've got it. And uh, so, Bill, where are you from and how'd you end up in Monterey? Uh, I was born in Southern California, Long Beach Memorial, Seaside Memorial, 1942. Um, I consider myself a refugee from LA. I lived down there and went through high school and went to UCLA, graduated, went off to, uh, the military, uh, had a wonderful Vietnam experience, three years in the army, something called army intelligence, the ultimate oxymoron. And then um, I used the GI Bill to go to uh, graduate school, Columbia University, journalism school, got a master's degree, thought I had a job offer on the Monterey Peninsula. This is back in June of 71. And the job disappeared uh, by the time I got here to take it. So uh, that's how I got to this area, June of 71. Bill, thank you so much for your service. Well, this thank you for, uh, <laughs> thanks for saying that. And a uh, shout out uh, to your wife, Mary, and all the Par uh, Parsons family, because I know it's a family affair. So a it shout is. out. Parsons family, uh, your winery yeah, now. It's Mary, and our three. I was just going to say it's Mary, our three daughters, Rachel, Allie, and Brooke. There, two of them are married uh, to Frank and Marshall, and then we have six grandsons: Rocco, Beautiful. Dario, Andro, Bixby, Tanner, and Hawk. And so they're all involved in the business, one way or the other. Wow, that's that, that, that's really great. Yeah. Um, when you got into the wine business, was it was like a dream, or how did it how did it happen, and when did it happen? A friend of mine talked me into uh, joining him in an investment in a large vineyard north of Sacramento, and uh, you know I took a lot of classes at UC Davis, so I'd kind of know what was going on with that. But uh, we made a lot of mistakes along the way, and eventually it went belly up. And uh, because of that, that sort of bitter aftertaste in my mouth of failure, I decided I wanted to plant my own very small vineyard and do a, a very small winery and kind of control the circumstances better than the previous business experience. Well, you got a good one. Let me tell you, you got a good one. Thank and you. And you're located in Carmel Valley, the vineyards? Yeah, the vineyard is uh, a half a mile east of the village on Carmel Valley Road on the, the north side. We have a nine and a quarter acre parcel with a seven acre vineyard and planted on the seven acres, three and a half acres of Syrah, two acres of Cabernet Sauvignon, um, an acre of Merlot and a half acre of Petit Verdot. Yeah, I know that you were the first uh, 
winery in Carmel Valley to plant Syrah. Uh, and that's a good one. Yeah, I think and, that, I believe that uh, Julian planted a little bit of Syrah before yeah. I did, but they weren't bottling it. They were blending it. They weren't yeah. trying to use it to make, a, you know, a, an estate Syrah. So there were some people who screwed around with it before I did, but I'm the first one to kind of go after it and make it my signature wine. Let me tell you something. I love it. A big, this is a, get, get yourself a ribeye and get the Parsonage Syrah because it's big, juicy. You're going to love it. It's, it. it's a good one. How many cases of uh, wine do you guys do a, a year approximately? Roughly 2,000. And, uh, you know, it varies from year to year how much is made from our estate and how much we make from other people's vineyards around here. Yeah. So in a bad year, a low yield year, a poor vintage year, we'll make more than half from fruit from other areas around here, other parts yeah. of Carnival Valley and Arroyo Seco. I, uh, I really like what you did at the tasting room in Carmel Valley. Uh, you guys put a beautiful patio out there that is just, it looks like it's been there for 20 years. It's beautiful umbrellas, and I wish you could keep it when this thing is over. So do I. Yeah, it's, my daughter Rachel really went after it aggressively. The county was very, uh, very helpful, very receptive, and it, it, the permit happened in three days. It was kind of mind-boggling, and uh, we get to keep it as long as we can't do normal tasting inside our tasting room. And uh, at the point that they lift the uh, embargo, if you want to put it that way, um, we have 60 days to stop using the outside space. Our fantasy is to try to figure out how to make it permanent, but we got to figure got to figure something out because there might be a little we'll bit of room. Try. You're gonna because we'll I mean that. it really looks good. It really oh, looks good. People out there. Have yeah, my daughters and Summer, our uh, tasting room manager, it's uh, much to their credit that it looks the way it yeah. looks. Yeah. Well, uh, Bill, what about the fire? Are you affected at all or the fire? Yeah, there's, uh, you know, we got hit pretty hard by the smoke. I feel like we didn't get hit as hard as we did in 2016. Yeah. The uh, fire set back everybody in the area. I think we were one of only two wineries to make um, wine that year, to have a 2016 vintage. It was uh, Parsonage and Silvestri. Everybody else decided that they didn't want to sm make a smoke-tainted wine. And, you know, the half the people can taste the smoke and the wine and love it. The other half are not too happy about it. So it's a hit and miss kind of thing. It's a little frustrating. Yeah, but some people, be hit and miss. Some but, people uh, might love it. It's great. Yeah, we had yeah. a bunch of people who fell in love with it. And uh, it's just a matter of, of finding the people who have that palate. Some people can't taste smoke at all in it. You know, they just don't have the, the uptake, yeah. the olfactory and flavor uptake on their palate. Yeah. I, I noticed when I've been in your tasting room, uh, you've got some beautiful artwork, some quilts up. Are those uh, your wife's or where do they come from, the, yeah, the quilts? Uh, my wife has been making fabric art, textile art, quilt art uh, for probably 35 plus years. Uh, she was a partner in a uh, fabric store called the Wild Goose Chase back in Pacific Grove, I think it was in the 70s, and that's when she first started quilting. And so her quilts are more wall-hanging quilts, not the kind that you put on your bed. Right. And uh, yeah. she's got quite a following, got quite a reputation. And so her quilt images are the art on our label. Every bottle we make has one or another of her uh, quilts represented. Okay. That was a question I was going to ask you. I was going to say, how did you figure out to put uh, the different 
labels. They're all like slightly different and you just answer the question. That that's really good. They're really cool looking labels. I love it. They yeah. are. They're unique. And uh, the interesting thing is we're probably the uh, we may still be the only person making G clay images of her quilts. We've sold hundreds, if not thousands. Oh, okay, got it. got it. Here. Yeah. So a lot of her quilts are represented as an image on canvas, uh, G clay form. Um, the technology has been around for quite a while, but I remember the first time I told, I said, I'm gonna, I'm gonna get some images of your quilts, and we're gonna make G clays out of them, and we're gonna sell them in the tasting room. And she thought I was an idiot. She thought I was a fool. But I uh, I made her eat those words. She's oh, actually geez. sitting there in the kitchen nook listening to me. Oh, you, you, say hello. you say hello for us, <laughs> Bill. That, 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 that's really She says hello, Mary. She says hi, Mary. Hello. <laughs> All right, that's great. Um, Bill, um, you do. Uh, you're a published art author, right? You wrote a book. Can you tell yes, us about published. <laughs> Yeah, I wrote a book about my Vietnam experience. So I was, uh, I, I was going to Vietnam to do army intelligence and something happened along the way. And I got Shanghai into the fifth special forces and, uh, spent my, uh, almost 12 months, uh, uh, in special forces, uh, kind of like a black ops outfit called detachment B 57. And, uh, I was in an A team on the Cambodian border for about eight months. So I wrote a book, um, an exaggeration of my experiences, uh, when I was there and I was in Vietnam late 66 through most of 67. And so my book takes place over a very brief period of time, as little as two and a half to three months. So I compressed all of my experiences, the combat experiences and the uh, unique things that happened. I exaggerated it dramatically, um, embellished it dramatically. My uh, superhero, he has, he ends up with uh, superpowers along the way. And you might have, least, a, a, might have a movie there, Bill. You might have a movie go, coming on. <laughs> yeah, that's what I always fantasize so, about. When, uh, when featuring, I, featuring The Rock playing Bill Parsons. <laughs> oh, I love it. Yeah. <laughs> We'd have to make him pretty young. You'd have to be, I was there when I was 24, 25 years old, but uh, we'd have to uh, use that, you know, unaging uh, program. Yeah. The unaging app if the rock wanted to be my hero's Congrats. name will perish okay. the whole idea was a lot of people notice this like will he perish well i don't want to give away the ending so maybe okay. he perishes maybe he doesn't you have to 